my name is Daniel Khayat. I look after products for HTC Vive in the Middle East and Africa. And we're very excited today to have you all uh, for our first webinar on transforming education in virtual reality and through virtual reality. I hope that every one of you is safe during this tough time and well seated to embark on this one hour informative session. Uh, first, allow me to send a big shout to the IC. Dubai Internet City is one of uh, our strategic partners and has been our home as a company for the last uh, decade. Uh, we're not just uh, part of the IC premises. Uh, we've worked together on various ventures on a yearly basis, from Tech Talks to key presence in Jitex, the largest um, IT and telecommunication conference uh, in the Middle East and Africa region. Uh, where we launched uh, our new products, where we had opportunity to meet with uh, developers around the, the region. And uh, I want to thank uh, individually uh, Mrs. Abir Khalid, who's representing Dubai Internet City and who's been pioneering supporting us on all these ventures. Uh, for some housekeeping instructions, since it's a large group and I can see now we've got more than uh, 40 people so far and we're expecting to reach 100 by the end of the session. I will be muting everyone to avoid any background uh, noise and uh, cameras will not be um, open uh, because um, it will help uh, have a flawless bandwidth connectivity. Um, our session today uh, will cover uh, two short presentations from our speakers, followed by a couple of videos um, demonstrating some of the educational contents a panel discussions and Q&A where we open the floor for you guys to ask questions and we can answer them. And for the questions we cannot answer, we will follow them up after the session by personal email communication. Uh, by then, I want to ask you please to write the same questions uh, you're going to ask in the uh, Q&A section so we can answer them. I have my colleagues who will be supporting in this while we will be speaking uh, so we can have a very uh, productive session. Uh, with me, I have uh, uh, David Bostarnik, who's a foundation lecturer for universities for many years, and who's been a uh, <clears throat> enthusiast into the VR uh, world, where he'll be telling you about his experience in VR when it comes to education, and how a person can give a real case uh, study on how he ventured into the VR experience with education, and how he can advise you if you are taking this route in the virtual reality world. Also, I have with me Mr. Steve Bamburi, uh, who's a pioneer of VR for education with many years of experience with schools and educational institutions in the regions, and is considered as the VR ambassador for education. Uh, please, uh, I want you to virtually welcome them uh, and allow them to start their presentations. Uh, uh, for me, just I would like to remind you of the actual um, social media handles from Instagram at Dubai Internet City. Uh, from Twitter at the IC underscore community and for LinkedIn and Facebook, uh, Dubai Internet City. If you at some point would like to share some comments, um, screenshot what you're attending or share what's attending, I believe it's going live on our uh, on their channel from uh, on Instagram. So we'd be happy to also receive any comments. I'll uh, give the floor to uh, uh, David so he can uh, cover uh, the part related to his uh, experience. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Um, I sort of feel like I'm opening for the stones here with, with Steve coming on after. Um, but I teach uh, English foundations at a college here in, in Sharjah. And I've been interested in, in VR for about two years now. And so I'm gonna talk about how I got into that and how I'm trying to blend my avocation or my interest in VR with my vocation or teaching um, in the future. Okay, so the, uh, oops, clicked too many times. Okay, so, okay, there's a bit of a delay, sorry about that. All right, so yes, my first time in VR, I think it was June, 2018. And Steve Bamberg came out to uh, one of our campuses with all of his gear for a demonstration. And the first uh, demonstration that he gave was putting me in uh, Richie's plank, watching, walking the plank from like the 88th floor. 
Uh, and so that was uh, really amazing. Because before that, I had used a PC to to do some VR work. But this was the first time in VR. And it's like scuba diving. You know, until you actually put on the headset and actually get into it, it's it's completely different. So, you know, intellectually, you know it's not real, but enough of your brain is fooled where it feels very real. Uh, sight, sound, movement, everything except smell. Who knows what will come in the future. But um, after that, I really started to get interested more in, in VR. Uh, still didn't have a headset, but I was able to use my PC to attend a number of... Oh, okay, I thought a number of um, sessions that Steve had CPD in VR. And so I found these quite fascinating, even in, in 2D. Um, but as an English teacher, I was trying to find how I could make that work for me. I mean, it was really amazing, and I was really interested in attending. But I, w I was an English teacher, and a lot of the guests weren't necessarily um, teachers. But then one day it hit me. The, the platform that he was using was in Engage. And Engage itself could be um, what could work for me. Um, it didn't matter what I taught. It didn't matter what, what the field. Uh, Engage um, was, was great. Um, also Altspace VR and various other social VR platforms. That it, I didn't have to be a developer or a venture capitalist or a uh, famed YouTuber. You know, it, it could work for pretty much anybody, um, whatever your field. And when I had that realization, that was like my second um, aha moment, the first being when I did Richie's Plank. So when I started to understand that even as an English teacher, I could, you know, have this work for me, it was really great. Um, so... I wanted to go to the, the slide before. Oh, okay, that was it. All right, sorry about that. Okay. Click, can you? Okay. All right, so as, as a teacher, um, technology is obviously very much a part of, of, of class. And so I started to also realize that um, technology and VR, I mean, VR and, and teaching could go together. Um, we have the SAMR model, which is basically different levels of, of how technology uh, integrates into the classroom. And VR is, is very much um, suited for that. I mean, even if you're just having a, a class in, in VR, uh, using something like Google Maps, but street level, so taking students and showing them around, you're able to do more than you were with just a regular um, picture of, of Google Maps. And if you're using different AR and, and VR um, platforms, you're able to, to show students to have integrate with, with different objects um, within the programs in, in a way that you wouldn't be able to do in, in classroom. So I started to, to do more research for, for that. And... Finally, I got my first headset, um, one that I could afford. Um, it wasn't strong enough to use for Engage, um, but I could use with Altspace VR and, and other applications. And so I had my, my foot first, you know, finally in the door of, of using virtual reality. And it was, it was amazing. I'd bring it to work. Um, I'd use it for Steve's series. And then another um, educators group specifically to, to VR came along. Uh, educators in VR, uh, co-founder was Daniel Dabosky Bryant out of Wales. Um, so now I could take part in, in VR and everybody was, was an educator. So I felt um, very much um, with kindred spirits. So next. All right. And finally, last summer, I got my my own six-off headset with two controllers, so now I could completely move around. I uh, started to network more. I started to to post more um, 
in Twitter, in LinkedIn, Discord. Um, I started to move from just liking people's posts and sharing to, to commenting and, and having actual input. So I really started to, um, to move up. Still very much an amateur, but uh, an enthusiastic one at that, at least. All right, so the next thing I was off and running with was trying to introduce uh, my colleagues with it. So whether it was um, playing table tennis or other games or apps, um, I would you know, try and evangelize as much as possible um, with it. And I had a, a fair amount of success. Um, some people were interested, um, some not so much. But, um, you know, there are different reasons for that. Basically, not everybody is interested um, in VR, but a lot of that comes from an awareness, lack of awareness of, of what VR can do. Or maybe they think it's just games. Um, time was also an issue. You know, everybody was busy with other things as well, so not everybody had time for something like that. Being able to find an HMD or you know, a headset, a VR headset, not always easy in the stores here. And they could be expensive sometimes. Um, like, you know, the cost of a, a new iPhone. So there are various reasons why not everybody uh, was interested. But I had enough. I had a, a foot in the door. Um, a number of colleagues uh, were interested. A few bought headsets. Um, I was able to work with one, one colleague in getting um, a student VR club uh, up and running which kind of got short because of the COVID-19. Um, but, you know, things were, were starting to move and I was starting to, to make my voice heard. And, and some people were starting to, to listen, which was quite um, good. Um, but, you know, things take time. And so I was advised by friends, you know, just be patient. You know, things will come. Things will happen. Take part in different activities, network. Um, you know, eventually people will come to you. And this is now happening. You know, higher-ups are now looking at uh, different ways of uh, integrating um, XR in, in education. Um, I've even been asked for my input, which was quite, um, you know, made me feel quite good because I'm not particularly high in the organizational chart. And so to be asked for my opinion, I thought was quite cool. Um, but where will we go? Uh, I don't know, but I have high hopes for where we, we do go. And, um, you know, the last two years of being patient and, and learning my way of, about VR has, has started to pay off. Just to close, um, you know, VR or XR adoption in, in higher education is going to take time. Um, it has to be done right. So I would advise people who are, you know, new to VR kind of like I still am, to be patient, but stay active. Um, and, you know, don't just try to evangelize with people who already know about VR. Try and reach out to friends and, and other people who don't know about it. You know, it takes everybody. And the more that we can create that aha moment for other people, um, the more people will eventually get involved with, with XR. And if those at the enterprise level, well, just remember that, um, you know, beginning level students come in with no real knowledge or experience of, of virtual reality. So we really have to teach about VR or XR before we can start to teach in it. Um, where do we want our graduates to, to end up? And then we work backwards and kind of give them the tools for that. But um, I think high hopes for the future. Um, I'm really loving VR in general, and I have hopes uh, for what's to come. Uh, that's Thank you very much, uh, David. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, uh, personally, I met with David more than a year back uh, at his university, and uh, I initially wanted to bring uh, David on board uh, to give a feel to teachers, to students, to graduates, to people who are uh, enthusiastic about uh, this technology, but they don't really know what to expect. And they think this is only 
uh, valid for people who are tech savvy and people who are really into uh, new technologies. Um, with what David is doing, with what I'm following, um, his post and his uh, articles and his comments, as he mentioned, he's really contributing back to the community of the virtual reality or XR in general. And this is a, an example from um, a, a person who's genuinely <coughs> sharing with us his thoughts and how he was able to embark on this journey. We, we thank you very much, David. I'll come back to you with the Q&A uh, so I can get more from our audience and uh, from few questions that are prepared after uh, Steve's part. Thank you very much. Okay. Steve, I'll uh, pass on to you. Thanks, Daniel. And thank you, David, as well for saying that it's like being the lead in for the Rolling Stones. I like that guy. Um, yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. My name's Steve Banbury. Um, some of you might know me, some of you might not. I, I've been based in Dubai for the last, well, almost 12 years now, the last 11 of which I was working at Jess, um, Jumeirah English Speaking School, uh, ultimately as the head of digital learning and innovation. Um, just before I move on, actually, I've just, I've just realized that this photo, so that this photo of this, this student here, it's a year 12 student from King Faisal School in Saudi Arabia. Um, I was over at King Faisal School in December for the G20 summit, and I just looked at my calendar while David was speaking, and, and this week, pre-pandemic, this week I was actually when I was supposed to be back at that school um, to, do the, uh, to, to do the rollout of two VR labs. Um, so, um, yeah, it's... It's a shame, but it's, it's nice that I can still highlight some of the stuff that uh, I've been doing with VR in education and hopefully share some best practice with you. Now, Daniel, I, I'm clicking forwards in slides, my friend. Uh, oh, there we go. I think maybe it's just on a bit of a hefty delay. So I will see how it goes. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, my name's Steve Bambury. I've been working in education for the better part of two decades um, and specializing in the, the use of uh, educational technology. Uh, I'm an Apple Distinguished Educator, Microsoft, yada, yada, yada. I've won a bunch of awards. I can chat about this stuff for a long time. But to be honest, in the last um, uh, four to five years, I have really have been known more for the work that I do with virtual reality than anything else. Um, I've, I've kind of stood at the cross-section of the two industries, the education space and the immersive technology industry. Um, Daniel, again, I've got... There we go. Okay. Is that you moving the slides for me, Daniel? It is. Okay. One second, then let me just see if I can. Oh, I have got remote control. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the, the use of VR in, uh, in schools for me began in 2014 um, with the, the first headset that I got hold of. And in the, the years that followed at Jess, I was able to explore a range of different uh, types of VR headsets and, and types of VR experiences. In fact, every single image you can see on screen right now comes from Jess, comes from the work that I did in particular in the last three years at Jess where I was head of digital learning and worked across the entire organization. And you can see that this, this went from using simple carpal VR headsets through to uh, more advanced mobile, he mobile headsets like the Viewmasters into uh, the original Vive and the Vive Pro and, and even the Vive Focus when that first came out. Um, so lots of experience there. I also run the, uh, Daniel, I, I don't know. Is this maybe because David still got control as well or something? I don't know, but it's going to be kind of awkward if I have to keep asking you to change slides. There we go. Maybe I've got control now. Let's see how we go. Um, where was I? Sorry. Yeah. So um, I also run a, a, a non-profit website, virtualityteach.com, which I uh, opened its doors about three years ago next month. And there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of articles on there ranging from case studies to um, theoretical articles. I also write a guest column for VR Focus, um, an education column for VR Focus. You can Google um, for VR Focus Steve Bambury and, and you'll find all of my columns uh, for VR Focus curated that way. Um, so there's, there's lots of content available from me. Uh, as David mentioned, I host the CBD in VR events. Um, the next one of which is actually next week. It's on May 30th. I'm hosting a panel discussion about uh, teaching inside VR with uh, Wendy Martin of 
holographic frog dissection fame. If you've seen the Victory VR frog dissection app, um, I've also got Charles Coomber with me who recently hit the headlines for teaching maths from inside Half-Life Alex and uh, Michael McDonald, who's been doing some amazing work with language learning in VR for the last year and a half or so. Uh, and then next month will be the three year anniversary event. And I've got a really big name in the VR industry lined up to be my keynote speaker for that event. That will be several hours of free sessions that I'll be hosting towards the end of June. Um, so just um, keep your eyes on my social media um, channels and you'll get an idea of more information about that. Um, as I mentioned, started hosting those events in 2017. Also in 2018, I hosted the world's first global lesson inside VR alongside the co-founder of Pixar, Lauren Carpenter, who you can see on the virtual stage in the image on the left here. Um, this is something where you can see um, clips from this on, on my site as, as well as a full write-up from the late Chris Long, who was the guy that coordinated the event alongside Immersive VR Education and the UK HTC Vive team. So there are obviously a lot of headsets. I've already mentioned about the fact that I, I've used a lot of different headsets in my time already. Um, I just want to clarify that uh, what I want to talk to you about today, I'm, I'm specifically talking about what I would call true VR, six DOF headsets. Um, I don't want to talk so much uh, these days about three DOF headsets, about the, the Google Cardboards that, that only track the orientation of the head. Um, there was an interesting discussion on social media recently about this, this idea of how Google Cardboard, as great as it was for introducing the masses to the concept of virtual reality, it has somewhat poisoned the well in that it has led to this mass misconception in terms of what virtual reality is, i.e. people now equate virtual reality to 360 media. And if you, you ask the, the average person what, what VR means, that they see it as being able to look around in a video or look around an image, uh, which is obviously um, the, the, the very, very, very tip of the iceberg when it comes to content you can access with an HMD. Um, I referred to it during an interview a couple of weeks ago, actually, as like listening to the radio on your TV. You know, you can tune into a radio channel on your television set, but it doesn't make it a television program it's still a radio program you're just using the medium of television to access that media in this case a, a radio show and it's very much the same for for 360 media yes you can access it on on a vr headset you can access it on on even the, the most expensive of vr headsets but it doesn't make it true room scale immersive virtual reality uh, and and that is really where my focus has been for the last few years this graphic that you can see here uh was uh, a redo of my original Depths of VR um, model, which I published in 2017, and then relaunched this, uh, this updated version during that G20 summit I previously mentioned that took place in Riyadh in 2019, uh, in uh, December last year. Um, and this, originally when I published this in 2017, it was about trying to understand and trying to help other educators understand that there was a lot more to VR than just 360 media because the go-to word, especially back then for every VR app was immersive, that this is so immersive. Um, and th there are definitely levels or, or depths even in terms of the, the immersion that you can experience within a virtual reality um, um, platform. And, and these do vary wildly depending on the, the level of the hardware that you're using. Um, that's not to say that they don't all have a valid place within the educational system, but there are definitely uh, greater things that you can achieve if you're using true six DOF VR technology. Sorry, guys, I've lost control of the slides again. There we go. Okay, we seem to skip past one. Don't worry about it. So, um, so I wanted to talk to you today. Well, oh, it's gone back again now. <laughs> Daniel, I don't know if this is you controlling this or me, my friend, or both of us. I'm trying to control it. And you're on mute as well, so I can't hear you. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just chat to you all today a little bit about the why of VR in education. I'm a huge fan of Simon Sinek's Golden Circle Principle. Um, 
I don't know if you are familiar with Sinek's work, but he's somebody that I encourage anyone in any field to, to look up. Amazing guy. The Golden Circle Principle focuses on the fact that all organizations should always start with the why rather than the how or the what if you uh, plan to be successful. And one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, in the education space is that VR is just another gimmick or it's just another gadget. It is something that is, you know, it's, it's, it's lumped in with uh, robots and Lego and 3D printers. And I think what people need to, to start to appreciate is that virtual reality under the, the, the umbrella term of immersive technology, immersive technology or spatial computing, whichever is the most popular on social media uh, this particular day or week of the month. It is the next stage in the evolution of computing as a whole uh, with the movement from PCs through to the web, through to tablets and mobile, and now into this immersive technology space. And shout out to Alvin Graylin, president of uh, HTC Vive in China, who, uh, who gave me this nice graphic a couple of years ago. I've got a controller back again now. Thank you. Very nice. Um, Another common thing that I hear is, you know, it's that idea of we should just wait because a better one will come along next year, um, which that procrastination is, is the death of innovation in schools and, and all organizations and all industries. And um, a, a guy I mentioned just now, the late Chris Long, who sadly died last year, Chris, Chris shared this during my uh, CPD in VR first anniversary in 2018, one of the uh, six hours of events that we hosted back to back inside Engage uh, was, was a presentation delivered by Chris and Chris shared this graphic and I'd never seen this before. And it was one of those times where you see something and it absolutely makes complete sense. So this is a, a model um, called Martex Law, which um, basically explains the, the fact that because organizations move slowly, but technology is changing at such a rapid exponential rate, what happens is this, this gap forms between where a company is at and where technology as a whole is at. And the longer an organization waits to act on this, the wider this gap gets. And ultimately what can happen is if the, if the organization does not act in time, it can lead to the company needing a, a complete reset. Now that could mean a huge investment, that could mean um, laying off huge numbers of staff to hire more skilled staff from other organizations. And ultimately it will be more costly to, uh, to an organization in the long run. So it, it, it's, it's worthwhile for all organizations, even schools, which are traditionally quite cash poor, to, to invest strategically in new technologies as they become available and start to, you know, start to dabble, start to explore the potential, because this is what's happening. You know, there are schools all over the world now that have already explored the role of cardboards and mobile VR in classrooms and are now beginning to set up VR labs, are beginning to explore the potential of headsets like the Vive Cosmos and the Vive Focus Plus and, and the ways that they can be used to, to really harness that, that, those higher tiers that, um, of virtual reality content. And this graphic here, the 10 key benefits of VR in education, this is actually another redux. This is something that I originally published, I believe, in 2018. And then uh, I re-debuted during Giatex last year, where I was the host of the education stage. Um, you can find the full write-up that goes with this graphic on uh, VR Focus. I believe I, gave, I gifted this one to them as a, as a guest post. Uh, and there's a high-res version of the graphic available both on there and on my site. Um, I mean, I, I can whistle stop through these for you very quickly, but there are the obvious ones, you know, that the, the global teleportation, the idea that VR can take you anywhere, that's very true. And it tends to be the thing that lots of people focus on. It can also be used to break down the barriers of time as well as space. So you can, you can use virtual reality to transport students backwards and forwards in time. Um, one thing that I talk a lot about in terms of VR versus AR and which is a, a more powerful medium for learning is the contextualization of learning that's a, a possible when you're using virtual reality. You know, the, the fact that you can put students into the actual places where um, the, the 3D objects that they might be able to view using an AR app 
um, you can see them within the context that they, they would have originally existed, you know, whether it's a historical statue in a historical setting. Um, extraordinary abilities. Again, I would direct you towards VR focus. I, I delivered a presentation with the great Paolo Polino who came over from China um, at BET in Abu Dhabi last year. And uh, that was all around the marvel of VR and it was kind of uh, tied in with the, the, the launch of the final Avengers movie and, and talking about the, the superpowers that students can get from using virtual reality um, experiences. Um, and, and you can see, uh, as I say, I, I've got some other slides that I want to go through. I'm not going to go through all of these here. I, I do encourage you to dig into the article itself and, and you can reach out to me directly if, you, if this is something you're interested in and you can't track it down through uh, traditional means. I am going to skip past these couple of slides here. I know that um, I know that David talked a little bit about Sam already. I just wanted to move on and uh, talk to you a little bit about data. So when I first started presenting about VR in education, it was uh, probably 2000, early 2017 was the first time where I, really my shift in terms of the presentations I was delivering at conferences, both here in, in the UAE and internationally moved from being very mobile technology mobile technology focused to being very much uh vr centric and in early 2017 when you were asked about data regarding the impact and the power and, and the purpose of a virtual reality in education the the party line was very much that the jury is still out because there hadn't been sufficient studies and you know you would traditionally say you know there does need to be more research um, the great thing is now that in 2020, there has been a range of studies. There's been a range of research from some really respected universities from all corners of the globe. And uh, so what I've got here is some data that's being culled from actually five different universities on, in, in four different countries. And these have been curated by me basically over the last 12 months. And again, another shout out to Alvin Graylin from, uh, from HTC Vive in China, because he tends to, when he shares these on social media, he tends to tag me in these posts and then my phone pings for 24 hours straight. Um, but what I found last year when I was organizing the slides for the G20 summit in Saudi was that these chunks of data that I've got, when you piece them together like the uh, pieces of a puzzle, they tell a very specific story and a very clear story about the power and potential of VR in education. So I just want to run through these, these five chunks of data with you and, and, and show you how this story um, comes together, how these puzzle pieces fit together. So this first chunk of data is from Cornell University in the States. Uh, Cornell tested three groups of students who were assigned different types of learning mediums, VR, 2D content, and a practical. And they found that 78% of students uh, preferred VR as the learning method. Now, my commentary there would be, of course they did. You know, this is a brand new, shiny technology, something different, something they've not tried before. So of course, yeah, it's engaging. The second piece of the puzzle comes from Warwick University in the UK. So Warwick also did a study with three different focus groups, this time using VR, video and textbooks. Uh, and Warwick's research showed that not only was there a more positive emotional response to the content in VR, but students went on to perform better. And this is something that people like Jeremy Balenson from Stanford, um, Stanford's Human Interaction Lab have, have talked about the, the, the emotive, visceral power of VR. There's no other medium that can create that emotive response in, in, in its users, um, and in this case, in its students. So, you know, we've got a, a technology that Cornell's data is showing us is, is definitely engaging for students. We're showing that it has a more positive response based on what Warwick found out. And that led to uh, better performance, which again, these pieces of the puzzle start to fit together. If students are engaged, if students are happy, they learn. The third study comes from uh, Saga University in Japan. And this was from the end of 2018, I believe. It was around December 2018, if memory serves. Um, so, what Saga University did is they actually run um, some, some uh, research into how the brain was affected using virtual reality technology. And what their data showed was that concentration levels went up by as much as six times when VR was being used for learning as opposed to other mediums. 
So again, you start piecing the puzzle together. You've got a medium which is engaging and is fun and it creates positive emotions with students. That's leading to greater levels of concentration. So we've got data coming from America to the, to the UK, now to Japan, and it's all piecing together. Now we hop over to China, to Beijing University, and Beijing University's study last year showed that VR significantly improved students' retention of learning, and that's a real trick. You know, what, what educators refer to as deep learning is, is a very, very special thing to be able to achieve. So increased retention in learning, which makes sense, using, if you refer back to the, the data from Saga University in Japan, because their concentration levels were higher. And if your concentration levels are higher, then you're gonna retain the information for longer, which leads to the final piece of data. This one comes from Beijing again, but this is from Beijing Foreign Studies University from December in 2019. Um, this is really interesting. And I noticed that there were a couple of, uh, I think ESL teachers in the group today. So you, you, you'll love this data. So Beijing Foreign Studies University, their research showed that VR improved language learning result, results by up to double, but also improved student confidence levels up to 10 times to actually apply what they had learned. Now, again, rewind through the puzzle here. We've got data from Cornell that shows that students were uh, more engaged by using VR technology than data from Warwick that shows that they, were, they had a more positive response and that they were achieving higher. We've got data from Saga University in Japan, which shows that they, um, their concentration levels were raised when using virtual reality. The concentration levels led to greater retention of their information, which is the data shown um, from uh, the first university from China. And then this final piece of the puzzle here, showing that not only is the, the level of, de of information uh, much higher, but the confidence to apply that information is through the roof. And of course it is, because if you have concentrated, if your concentration levels have gone up and your retention of information is much higher, then you're going to be more confident applying what you've learned because it feels much more deeper embedded within your own mind. Um, I think all of this is best summed up in this quote, and this is my all time favorite VR quote from the grandfather of VR, Professor Tom Furness from Washington University, guy who's been working with virtual reality since the 60s. Uh, in essence, being in a virtual world is like writing on the brain with permanent ink. And um, I will actually, I'll tell you what, I'll actually use this moment to, uh, to reveal something. Um, some of you may know that um, I've recently signed a book deal. My, my first book, Immersive Impact, uh, all about virtual reality and education is gonna come out hopefully just before Christmas. And um, it gives me absolute pleasure and, and the utmost honor to say that Tom Furness has agreed to write the foreword for my book. So a huge, huge, huge thank you to Tom. That's the first time that's been actually publicly announced. But yeah, Tom Furness, the grandfather of VR, is going to write the foreword to my book. So I feel incredibly honored uh, by that. Um, guys, there, there's my contact details. You're more than welcome to reach out to me on any of these platforms. Um, I live on an inbox of zero or I reply to every message I'm sent. So by all means, do uh, to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'll pass back over to Daniel. And um, yeah, Daniel, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Very informative. I mean, um, as, as, as we wanted from the beginning, um, as HTC Vive and DIC hosting this session, we don't want to talk about the product and uh, tell them about the technology. We want to tell them, show them the power of this technology. And the, there is no best example than education that you and David have shown. I'll be uh, uh, asking you a few questions. Uh, before that, I'm going to show a couple of uh, um, experiences uh, on a video that I'll be running uh, to showcase uh, some of the examples um, in VR in application through applications that people can host within their organizations, within their um, um, schools, institutions, universities, uh, and some of the examples that you have mentioned in reality. Um, just allow me to share uh, those uh, videos. So, okay. Okay, uh, the first one is from um, Engage and uh, Steve talked a little bit about it, and as well as uh, David, he talked about it. And uh, Engage is a platform um, also uh, partnering with HTC where it offers 
uh, content for um, education. I assume that the audio is working, right? Just to confirm, Daniel, we can't see a, a video right now. Okay, can you see it now? No. Can you see it now? No. Can you see it now? No, sorry. There's no video, right? Okay, if the video is not visible, I'll be sharing the, the app's names. I can now uh, uh, move quickly to the actual um, experience and go to the panel discussion. So the actual uh, apps that um, I wanted to sh share, maybe later on we will run them uh, by you, is Engage, where people can engage in virtual reality by teaching, communicating, and learning. This could be used for meetings, it could be used for people in different locations to engage on one platform. And as you've seen, um, you were not able to see on the video, we can bring 3D artwork, we can bring people to a different environment, uh, send them to a place where they want to learn about a specific uh, location and from there uh, live the experience. Uh, VibeSync is um, um, an experience for engaging through meetings and platforms for collaboration where you can present your PowerPoint, your videos, your PDFs, engage in VR, meet people in virtual reality uh, in a specific uh, uh, auditorium uh, or conference or meeting platform. The third one is the spaces where people can join a Zoom call on a VR uh, avatar. So similar to what we're doing now, uh, or Teams or Skype or whatever, you can have an avatar where you can join the call, uh, take notes, write, engage with people, have the board and uh, discuss uh, details about um, any um, uh, platform related to education. Uh, I want to just uh, start taking a few questions. Um, I've seen the questions uh, by the panelists, uh, to the panelists actually. Yeah, I've just been I've just been answering a few in text form for you, Daniel, because there's quite a few come in. Okay, um, I just want to uh, uh, second. Okay, I've got a um, question about uh, how to act, uh, access educators in VR groups, and is that on the Engage platform um, exclusively? So, um, Steve. Uh, no, okay, so, so Educators in um, VR was set up by, uh, as, as David mentioned, a great guy who's based in Wales called Daniel Dabosky uh, Bryant, um, along with a couple of other people. Daniel, very much like David, he, Daniel came to one of my events in 2018, had his mind blown and uh, decided to, to pick up the ball and run with it and um, has grown that group fantastically. And they, they recently hosted a whole week's worth of events which um, I, I was delighted to be part of as well. Daniel, uh, that you can, I mean, if you, if you go on, I think it's just educatorsinvr.com, you'll find all the links. Yeah. But they have a Facebook group and a Discord channel. I think they do a lot of the stuff through Discord. Um, and they've got all the, all the usual kind of social media channels as well. They host events. They are um, a bit more platform agnostic than me. I host all my events in Engage. They do some events in Engage, but they do a lot. I'd say probably a lot more events in alt space. Um, because the accessibility bar Very for good. all space is a lot lower, so more people can get in. 
Very good. So, yeah, Thank just, you. Just go search for it and you'll find it. Thank you. I'll take another question from Ahmed Al Banna. Is the headset used for education different from the one used in games, or any Vive headset can be used in both? Um, actually, there are two types of headset. I'll answer this question since it's related to the hardware. Uh, the headset that are um, connected to a, a powerful PC, we call it a gaming PC, where it requires uh, high um, graphics capability. And for that, you'll be able to get high capability of uh, immersive experience and high graphics when you see which, which is close to reality. Uh, these, uh, depending on the experience, I can say, in training, for example, for oil and gas, where they look at the seismic levels of the underground platforms, yes, they need the powerful one. Uh, there is the head-mounted display, which is the like the Vive Focus or the Focus Plus, which is uh, standalone, where the battery and the processor is inside. Uh, you don't expect a high graphics capability, but it's a great experience at 70% rate compared to the high-end one, but it all depends on the experience. Um, again, gamers and gaming require the highest capability of fast moving, high graphics, low latency, while in education you are in a much more relaxed environment, so you don't need to push the boundary to high graphics. Um, I, I'll take another question uh, by um, Julian Wright. Hi David, what technical or policy challenges have you faced in trying to get VR recognized? Well, at, at my level, I don't really deal with that. I, I teach English foundations, and so there are, are people higher up who, who are working on that. Um, and I, I hope that we will be starting to trial something in, in the, the coming months. Um, but that, that's really ab ab above my pay grade at the moment. Okay. I'm, there the, is I'm a, still, yeah. yeah. There is another question for David and Steve. How can higher education use VR to supplement education that can't be done online? i.e. work placements, experiential learning, etc. I'm thinking about health science students in particular who do internships in hospitals as part of their undergrad degree. This is from Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, you definitely will start to see more and more industries using VR for, for corporate training and, and also for professional development towards different careers. Um, and... Uh, you know, in terms of like teaching science, like Wendy Martin, who, who's joining me on my show next week, uh, she was originally the, the, the holographic teacher inside the Victory VR Frog Dissection app, but Victory have now signed a deal with Immersive VR Education. So they're, they're, they're building this whole Victory XR Academy inside Engage, where there will be live lessons being taught. And I, I was lucky enough a couple of weeks ago um, to be part of one of these where, where Wendy Martin, and, and for those that don't know Wendy, she's um, a multi-award winning science teacher from the United States. Um, absolutely amazing teacher. And she had a group of students there inside Engage, <coughs> excuse me, and she taught a live lesson. And I think that will become more and more uh, prevalent. And somebody, I answered a question just now in the Q&A, somebody had asked about the potential for VR to replace the traditional um, like the traditional school paradigm um, and, and my response was that even if the, even if you shift into a virtual space we're still talking about real teachers um, my old, my old boss the, the former director of Jess Mark Steed he also used to talk about the rise of the rock star teacher um, and and the fact that you know in in over in the east you will get sort of these these rock star personal tutors these personal tutors that uh, have built the, these reputations and can command these really high fees for, to work with uh, individual students. And what Mark foresees is that, that, that with the shift towards virtual reality, that, that there is going to become this demand for the best of the best teachers. Once the geographical borders completely dissipate, you know, if, if I've got the money and I want the best education in the world for my, uh, for my child, it isn't no longer governed by who is physically close to where I live. So suddenly we could end up in a position where, you know, a kid's getting taught science in the morning by a Nobel prize winning scientist and then doing a, a literacy class in the afternoon with, with a famous writer or, you know, or, a, or an award winning literacy yep. teacher who's, who happens to live on the other side of the world. And I think you'll start to see that more and more, um, but using the virtual spaces as the medium. Yep, thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Ahmed. Um, also for a lecturer like mine who's good in programming, would it be hard for me to create VR content to help in my class? 
I'll, I'll, I'll answer this question because we work a lot with developers working on content. Uh, just to give you a very high level nutshell on um, how to develop a content in VR. Basically, VR uh, requires two types of visuals, either what we call a CGI, which is a computer graphic um, um, images, uh, which is uh, something that um, computer, science, uh, computer graf uh, graphic uh, individuals draw and design, and they build it, stitch it, and put it in 3D. And then this 3D content will be taken to a computer scientist. This computer scientist will program it and will create actions around it so we can have movements, so we can create the experience. And all this is designed by a storyboard where you, the inventor of the content, have to build it. On the other hand, you can go with a 360 content where it's shot by a 360 camera or a video of a camera or a drone 360, so which will have real footage. Then again, it will be taken to the graphic um, uh, uh, engineers and experts to stitch it, clean it, and uh, work it in this sphere. And then all this will be taken to the computer scientist to code it and develop it and get the motions and actions around all this. This entire requires storyboard. So uh, one person cannot do all. We've, we've met people who's got the skills to be um, uh, um, an engineer and computer scientist and good in graphics, but it's difficult to get these, uh, all these done. Um, I'll take another question also from, uh, uh, from uh, Amid Rauf, which is, uh, he's saying it's a beginner question. What is the basic difference between a Vive and Oculus in terms of software handling? Um, uh, there are within, I also allow myself to answer this because it's also related to hardware. There are uh, different uh, categories of, uh, of what we call them uh, the, the products we are in Vive and in Oculus, and there are a few that matches each other. There are a few here and there, which is slightly more expensive, a little bit here and there. I don't want to, I know I work for Vive, and I believe these are the best product in the world, but I don't want to get into this comparison. Um, it's not the right forum here, but I can tell you that um, in general, and more or less, they use, both use the same platform, the same engine, which is Steam VR. Uh, from a content perspective, you won't feel much. Um, a little bit here and there. Uh, the tracking system might differ from some to another. Some require base stations and laser that, uh, that scans the environment for room scale, and some it, require, it, it has inside-out tracking. So depending on the use, you can reach out to the HTC Vive team um, if you have any requirement. One important thing when it comes to enterprises, institutions, and B2B customers, uh, uh, Oculus, uh, Oculus is, and Facebook is not present in the Middle East and Africa region. They are only selling in some retails and online channels, while HTC has a dedicated team with warranty and services that you can reach out to them if you have any questions. Uh, I'll jump uh, on that one. Yep. Go ahead. So that, that is one thing I would, I would say, Daniel, is that that comes up from time to time is, is, as, as a friction point in terms of VR and education is the confusion that, that arises over where the content can be found. You know, and I, I've worked on projects where I've curated educational lists of content because, you know, if, if you're dealing with iPads in a, in, a, in a school, then you know that you get your apps from the App Store or if you're on Chromebooks, you get them from the Play Store. But with the headsets, it is a little bit different. You know, you can get content. If you've got a Vive headset, you can get content from Viveport. You can get content from the Steam store. Um, similarly, with an Oculus, you know, that you can get stuff from Oculus, you can get stuff from Steam. Uh, and it can, can be a little bit confusing to educators. Um, I would broadly steer educators away from the Steam store um, because the Steam store is, is much uh, much more open. There's a lot more uh, inappropriate content on there. I've definitely never let any students loose anywhere near the Steam store. Whereas the Vive Port platform, um, you know, you're not going to find any inappropriate content on there and you're going to find it much easier platform to, to navigate in terms of the different types of experiences you're trying to find. Um, and you'll find more educational experiences on there as well. Um, one, one of the things that I like about the, the Engage platform is that whatever you're teaching, you, you, can, you have you know, password if you want, so only your students are going to, to get in. So security. particularly in this part of the world, you know, there's, there's much more security um, for something like that, and, and that's an important consideration. Okay, I'll take um, for the next five minutes more questions uh, to wrap it up, because I know 
we're running out of time. I think Mr. Ahmad has got a question about an issue he's facing with HTC Vive. I'll get the right team to reach out to you so they can find a solution for you. I don't think it's the right forum here. Uh, if, we're, if we're starting in VR, which headset do you recommend, David or Steve? <laughs> well, at, at the time, what I could afford was, uh, was Oculus Quest. Um, but for consumers, you know, it's, it's all well and good. But as you mentioned, um, Oculus doesn't have a presence here in, in, in the Middle East. So uh, now I would probably go with um, the Focus Plus because there okay. seem to be a lot of options open um, that okay. HTC offers and you have Thank a presence you. here. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Um, another question from anonymous attendee. Uh, how can AI be integrated in VR? Um, again, since it's related to the hardware, I can answer this question. We've got uh, um, different ways to integrate and there, will be, there should be a lot of work uh, from the developer on the actual SDK. One of the examples that I can give, we've got um, a headset called the Vive Focus Plus Pro I, uh, sorry, Vive Focus Pro I, which is a headset that uh -huh. uh, has eye tracking and lip tracking. So whenever the eye is looking in the virtual world, um, it tracks exactly and it detects and collects data. So uh, where we consider this one type of the AR, the same applies for lip tracking where people is, are speaking in VR, they can see their avatar with their lips moving and uh, you can extract data and have some integrated artificial intelligence. Uh, if you're interested more, you can reach out to us, we can explore this. Uh, another question from uh, Samir, who is excited about VR in the education and uh, his question is related to content. Uh, he's finding that using Unity is very heavy duty software and they're not very friendly. What uh, do, do you know of any software for educators to create their own content? Like some wizard uh, type of software and applications? So, so uh, what, as a step towards Unity? Yes. It depends on the age of your students. The, the kind of gold standard starting uh, platform is Cospaces. So Cospaces EDU allows you to, to use a very simple drag and drop um, 3D space interface to, to build 3D scenes, which you can then deploy into um, VR headsets um, and also into augmented reality. Um, it will work natively on, on like uh, through the through the CoSpaces app. It will work natively on on a mobile VR headset, you know, on a phone inside a cardboard or something. But you can also log into the platform on. Um, on, on a, a, a web browser that supports web VR uh, and you can access within, within a higher end headset as well. So Cospaces it tends to be, it's always been my stepping stone towards the, the, the harder stuff. There's another platform that's just launched called Zoe and I'm, I'm trying to get access to that at, literally as of last week um, and that very much seems... It's got a plug-in for Unity, and it's, seen, and it's very much aimed at educators. I'd, I'd love to tell you what I thought of it, but I, I haven't had a chance to go hands-on with it yet. I'm hoping to next week. But it's called Zoe. Um, Zoe okay. VR. Um, yeah, you. it might be worth looking into. That probably is the, kind of the middle ground then. If, if it does what it says it does, it'll be the middle ground between co-spaces and a full, um, full Unity uh, development. Okay. Uh uh, please, I need 30 seconds for the next each question. Uh, uh, in your opinion, how does AR have a benefit over VR and vice versa? Uh, I, I wrote a five, five piece article, nearly 5,000 words on this in 2018. If you go on my site in the theory section, we need a 30 see, second uh, answer. Five rounds of it. VR wins 3-2. That's a spoiler for you. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, just to add to this, um, from HTC's perspective, our, our um, headsets are equipped with uh, cameras, so you can mix VR and AR and uh, uh, win both uh, and have both worlds as a mixed reality. A question from Becky. Are schools, universities, and companies using mostly off-the-shelf pre-existing content, or are they actively involved in the curriculum slash content development? If it's the latter, how do they balance the cost and time sensitivity of creating VR content quickly, hiring and developing in-house versus uh, partnering with a vendor? Uh, not many schools actually partner with vendors right now because we're too early in the, in the life cycle of VR um, for that for, for, for most schools. If you're creating, I mean, you can go into a free platform like Altspace and create worlds in there for nothing. You can, you can use uh, co-spaces and create worlds 
for nothing. You can use engage and create spaces for nothing. So I think those are those free tools um, are, are what schools are accessing right now. If they're already at the place where they're creating content, they're, they're creating it in those mediums. So it's not costing them a penny. Quick and love, for and love platform. I'm oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. Well, and a lot of the platforms, for example, engage or even alt space, you can use your own media um, in those environments, whether you have a PowerPoint or a YouTube video or, or whatnot. So even those who, who can't code um, can still use it as a, a classroom environment and present pretty much the same media that they would if they were teaching um, face to face. Quick one for Steve. Uh, Ziad Hani is asking, can he join your live panel session next week? Uh, yeah, I think there's space left. I, they, they tend to fill up quite quickly, but uh, I think there's still a couple of spaces left. If you, if you just look at my social media channels, you can always find the, the links to the panel discussions. And I, and I dropped a link to it in about 20 different VR and education Facebook groups last week as well. So Excellent. you can find the link or just reach out to me directly and I'll give you the link. Or just go on the Engage website and you'll see the, uh, under the events, you'll see it listed there. Okay, another question from... Um from Ahmed, uh, when do you expect this technology to be available for, let's say, most people? And it will be really available to all, uh, not only certain users. Mass adoption? Yep. That's a $64 million question, isn't it? Um, five years, within the next five years. Okay, from Meghna, uh, besides education, where do you see VR playing a massive role, having a massive impact, especially in the post-COVID uh, world? Uh... Which industries? Training, uh, we can say for sure. Training, definitely. Real estate, uh, conferences, uh, and those types of things. Um, everything, really. I'm trying okay. to think of any others. I'm going to choose a um, couple of questions to, to end up with, and then the rest we will um, answer individually. Uh, can Vive build a VR human dissection uh, lab? in which both instructors and students can see the same thing at the same time? A, a live dis dissection lab? Yeah. Dissection, that's, this is misspelled. Yeah. That's basically what Wendy Martin did with, with us inside Engage a uh, couple of weeks ago. So yeah, as long as you're in a multi-user space, that's definitely where we're headed. And what was that app that you had me use on the... Um, at, was it uh, Jitex the other year? Or it was really the organ. Organ. Heart? Really organ. Yeah. Yeah. Check, uh, yeah. The organ. A last question to David and Steve. I've attended a CPD in VR event um, in the Engage platform. Could I also use the platform to present PD to classes who may or may not have the headsets? Yeah, you can access, oh, yeah. You can access in 2D mode. You don't need to have the headset. So there'll be a bunch of people in the audience that are, are there just joined on, on, a, on a computer screen and, and you move around using the WASD keys like you would on Minecraft or something like that. Well, uh, obviously, it's not as immersive, but it, but it still gets you in the door. Well, that's what I was doing for the first year until I got my, my first headset. Yeah. Yeah. You, can do, you can pretty much do everything except, you know, you can't raise your arms because you've got no arms to move. Yeah. But other than that, you can even present um, yeah. on, from a computer. It's not as immersive, but it's a good start and it's a good feel, particularly if you don't have a headset yet or you don't want to invest in one yet. Start off with 2D. Um, it's, it's a great way to start. And I think a lot of institutions um, might look to that um, as an initial start because it saves money as well. I mean, everybody's got computers, but not everybody has a headset. Great. Thank you very much for all of you who attended. Again, a big shout to Dubai Internet City for hosting this um, initiative. Mm -hmm. As you can see, loads of questions, a lot of interaction, great speeches from both David and Steve. Uh, we're very honored to have you guys. Thank you very much for your time. And hopefully we'll have other sessions and other meetup with you. Have a great day to everyone. Thank you.